Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Vivek Kumar. I am a chair and president of MIT Stanford Venture Lab, which is VLab. So before we get into this event, I would like to thank our partner, Global Entrepreneur Summit and The Seed, who has uh, worked with us to put together this, this event. So really, I want to thank them. So please give them a big round of applause. If you do not know about SEED, right? So SEED is Stanford Institute for Innovation in Developing Economies. And so far, they have worked with 150 African companies for the last two years. And we are very fortunate to have 12 companies uh, in this room. So as I take your name, please stand up so that we can recognize you and we'll know a little bit more about you, right? And please pardon me. Being Indian, I cannot take Indian name. And I have to read name of African heritage. So my apologies in advance if I butcher your name. I will buy you a beer after the <laughs> event. So now you know who I am, Vivek Kumar, right? I will leave my card. But anyway, just kidding. Coming back to the business. So very first, Femi Oe. Shh. Femi, you are here? Please, <laughs> Please stand up. Uh, Chief Architect of Go Solar, uh, which is the leading African clean energy technology company. Patricia Zondi Yao, founder and, founder and CEO of SP Telecom, a rising information and communication technology company focused on data security and access control. Ihi Biniti, co-founder and uh, chief technology officer of Rencard, tech giant of Africa looking to expand its global reach in ICT space. Abim Bola Yuku Bena, Chief Executive, uh, sorry, Executive Director of Health Forever, a uh, wellness company built around spreading the use and awareness of safe natural products. Here you are. <laughs> Kweku Asma, Founder and CEO. Welcome. Of Process and Plant Automation Limited, an industrial electromechanical equipment design and build company which provides innovative solutions and control and technical support for various sectors, including construction. Welcome. <laughs> Constant Swanikar. <laughs> Founder and CEO of Accents and Art, uh, furnishing and decor. Artisan creating the unique combination of wrought iron, wood, cane, and glass. So welcome. Um, Michael Amankwa, CEO of Cornet. Michael, welcome. So Cornet operates in the financial technology space and provides the suite of transaction and payment processing services for business. Elise Dobega, welcome. <laughs> Founder and CEO of Elisi Case, a food services company offering the uh, conveniently packaged organic, oh, organic agriculture product with emphasis on ethical supply chain management and women empowerment. So welcome. Okay. Seri Baro, if I'm saying correct, please. Did I say your name correctly? Oh, thank you. Woo! Right. Founder of uh, People Input, a consultation agency providing the boutique services in digital space, including mobile applications, social media, and web marketing. We should talk after this. <laughs> okay, because I'm also a marketer, so that's why. Okay. Uh, Simplis Ano, founder and CEO of Digital Africa Telecom. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> mobile content and interactive games, uh, telco solution company. So after this, if you have any question about the event on your brochure, you can send us a comment by sending a text on 650, which you can also see on the screen, 650-308-8522. And your feedback is very important so that we, make it, we can make this thing better. If you're tweeting this, then our Twitter handler is VLAB Africa. So uh, I would like to welcome, uh, Ajwa, where are you? So who? <laughs> Please come. Oh, really? Yep. Hi, Eric. Hey, hi there. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ehi Binitier. I'm um, co-founder and CTO at Rancard. 
Um, 15 years ago, we set out with a dream, a vision, to change the perception of what it means to be an African company. Um, and this afternoon, um, I think I'm here not to pitch a product, or pitch my company. I'm here to pitch the idea of African excellence. So we, and for good reason, we've been fortunate, we've been blessed, we're in a Series C, we've um, raised institutional funding from Intel Capital, from Adlibo Capital, from Peninsula Capital. We've grown our company from out of um, Taifa in the back of Accra, across 25 countries in Africa, Middle East, Southeast Asia. And so we're blessed in many regards. And I think that our biggest challenge and our biggest obstacles and how we take that growth and create multiplier effects. We set out with this dream because the perception of what it means to be African is usually flawed. You think of wars, of problems like um, AIDS, etc., And that's not what is representative of the company. What Ranker does, or the con continent, what Ranker does is build some software which enables businesses find customers and do so more efficiently. Um, what many of us don't realize is that advertising, digital display advertising, 97% of the time misses its mark. And yet you have the market leader in that space um, being a multi-billion dollar company. So only 3% of all advertising actually hits the spot. And this represents an interesting opportunity. This is the kind of problem which Ranked likes to solve. Um, over the last 15 years, um, we've built, we've taken on some of the world's most difficult problems with many of the world's leading companies. About 2004, we were solving a problem which helped General Electric figure out problems before they happened. Um, so we took data from all of GE's 700 businesses worldwide, put them in a, in a predictive model, and generated a 3D dashboard for them, which helped them solve problems. Um, Many years later, Google was trying to scale Gmail across the world. And in many parts of the world, there was no connectivity. And so we had to design protocols from the ground up, which enabled them to deliver Gmail many times over SMS in many of the most difficult circumstances, delivering the highest reliability in the world, 5.9 SLAs, um, where the infrastructure simply wouldn't support things like that. We help the BBC, ESPN, MTV, VOA scale their businesses, get their content out across the world to many of the world's leading markets. And it's this idea of African excellence which I'm pitching, I'm talking about. Interestingly, I wasn't the smartest guy in my class. Okay? Um, and when I think of, actually I wasn't even close to the smartest guy in my class. There were people in my class whose calculus was better than their English and could reproduce the works of Newton from first principles under exam conditions. And I'm not kidding you. Um, and yet, you have a continent where all this talent goes to waste and doesn't really amount to much because um, when we think of the continent and what it can produce, we don't think of it as much. We think of, why don't we focus ourselves on Africa's problems and why don't we, why don't we solve only the problems around us? I'm, I'm here to challenge that status quo. I'm saying, look up a bit, put your head up, you're capable of solving the problems around the world. You're capable of scaling your opportunities. And I think I'm just here to sort of set the stage for some really excellent people who are coming right after me. Um, and I'd like to please just celebrate them, um, ask you to kindly give them a round of applause. And Thank you for your time this afternoon. Thank you. Okay, are we continuing? Can we, hello, is this on? Okay, everyone, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. And everyone else, thank you very much for attending the Africa Rising panel. Um, before we get continued on with the pitches, I'd like to do a little introduction, uh, talk about the people that we have, the judges that we have, uh, to comment on these uh, fine entrepreneurs from the continent. 
And so, and I'm going to, I'm going to start it with one question. So as you go into introducing yourselves, each of them comes from a different vantage point with regard to investing on the continent. They're all active investors, but some of slightly later stage, some in different regions. So as you go on and introduce yourself, talk a little bit about where you're investing and uh, why you chose that specific area, whether it be uh, co company specific or region specific. I guess I can start. Um, my name is Lexi Nowitzki. I run a venture capital firm in Lagos, Nigeria called Singularity Investments. And we're focusing on early stage investments in technology, media, and telecommunications. Um, and uh, so I moved out to Nigeria about four years ago. Um, and I was really attracted to the macroeconomic factors, uh, young population, um, increasing mobile penetration and smartphone penetration and improving infrastructure and improving governance as well. I mean, we still have lots of issues there, of course. Um, so that's why I originally picked up and moved to Nigeria. And uh, my capital also comes from a high net worth individual who's built Africa's largest telecommunications company on the continent. So, and he began this company in Nigeria, so that is, that's also um, why we're focused on that market primarily, although we are focused on Pan-African opportunities as well. Oh, hello there. My name is Eric Osiakwan. I'm a technology entrepreneur and angel investor, um, and uh, I'm from Ghana originally. Um, I sort of stumbled into doing this, uh, you know, I didn't plan to be uh, an entrepreneur or the or an investor, but I was early in the um, late 90s into uh, 2000 when Africa started getting connectivity. So I was involved in helping build a couple of ISPs, including Busy Internet in Ghana, which was sort of the most famous and popular. And um, I actually remember meeting Ehi Kofi uh, and Ehi when they started uh, Rankard uh, behind IDN office. Uh, that's how I met Ehi, and they've come a really great way. But Opportunistically, I got involved in a company uh, called SMSG that does the same thing that Ranka does. Uh, and so um, uh, co uh, that company is also went to the seed program. They were actually here uh, in the last cohort. Um, it's a company that is uh, grown now uh, to $10 million in revenue as of last year. Uh, it's called smsgh.com if you want to check it out. And it's got offices in four countries, Ghana, Cameroon, Nigeria, Kenya. Um, employs about 60 to 80 people now. Um, and it's a classic case of a company that went cash flow positive in the first year and then grew 50% year on year. Um, and I always say the SMSG story um, to the extent that these, these guys are outliers uh, in the sense that you don't have a classical company sort of just shooting off and then sort of being cash flow positive and growing in that direction. But it also speak to the fact that probably they got a lot of support from myself and all the people who were involved in the company in the old days. And also to the extent that um, Alex, Enes, and Kojo, who are the senior managers of the company, are really smart people. Um, I mean, they've built technology from ground up. Um, so that's sort of my high end of my sort of investment uh, companies I've invested in. And essentially, I recently backed a company called Forhe. So I just made two investments, and I'll tell you about them. Um, for hay is an Uber for laundry. Um, so imagine that you can um, order uh, your laundry the same way you order Uber. So the website is www.forhey.com. So you, you can go and order a laundry whilst I talk. Uh, but, but this company, I got into this company because there was, it's a kind of a fascinating story. Um, and the idea that, um, I mean, this guy from um, Ghana could move to New York and intern at a laundry and then come back and then start a company and believe that he could build an Uber for laundry out of Accra is just incredible. And, and for me, it speaks to the narrative that he was alluding to a little bit earlier on that you have a new generation of Africans, or Africa's millennial, who are beginning to think that we can actually conquer the world. We don't need aid, uh, we need trade. And so that's quite powerful. And so for me, as uh, somebody who's done this before, built ISPs, sort of leveraging my experience and my expertise and also writing small checks to back up these companies. Because I really think that this is how Africa is going to dominate the 21st century. And so we invest across five markets. Um, and, and I'm sure all of you in this room know that Africa is a continent, not a country, right? I don't, we don't need to do that. Um, and so sometimes it's difficult to deal with 54 countries on a continent. So I have a concept I call the African Kings. Um, and these are the markets that I believe are leading the digital economy. 
And so um, let, let me see whether the others in the room, including my friend uh, Peter, who was nice enough to come out from um, JP Morgan. Let's see how well you know Africa. So Kings is K-I-N-G-S. So the first country starts with a K. Which country is that? Kenya. Wow, you're very fast. <laughs> Peter, did you tell him there? <laughs> um, I is? OK, I would impress that here. And then it's Nigeria, Ghana, and South Africa. But, but so I want to end on a note that so the Keynes concept, the idea is a little bit that the other countries like Senegal, Rwanda, um, Tanzania, where you're seeing a lot of innovation as well. But if you take the Keynes, their country is sort of setting the pace, so to speak. And, and it allows the other countries to sort of catch up on it. So um, this is what I've been doing. And, and finally, I was sort of end on a note. We also have an event called Angel for Africa, which we basically curate entrepreneurs and investors and bring them together. And this year, we're doing it in Kenya. Um, it's the 10th and 11th of November. So I'd like to invite you all to come out there and, and check it out. And we're going to have a safari too afterwards. OK. Um, hello, everyone. My name is uh, David van Dijk. I run an organization called the African Business Angel Network, um, which is uh, effectively the coming together of a number of relatively new local angel investor networks, Lagos Angels Network, uh, Ghana Angel Investor Network, Cameroon Angels, Victoria Ventures, and there's about uh, 34 initiatives, groups, networks, and about 26 countries that, are, that have come up in the, in the recent years, if you will. Um, and the objective is very simple. We want to try and help and get many more investors educated, trained, connected, and doing deals in Africa. Um, with the primary focus on local investors, so people who are based in, in, on the continent, and obviously also build a bridge to the diaspora and other people that are invested, uh, sorry, interested in, uh, in, uh, in Africa. Now, the ABAN itself is a non-profit, so we do not invest, but our members obviously do. And maybe just to touch upon the, the question from Maya. So angel investors are, are, are individuals. They're all unique. So there is no one invest, investment thesis, if you will. So some people are early stage or late stage, look at different... Uh, different uh, 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 sectors, if you will. Um, but most are at a, at a relatively early stage. And then if they, what they look for in, in, in companies, obviously at that stage, that will, you know, they usually will not be market shares. There will not be little information on, on your financials. So then it's a lot about, you know, do you believe in this entrepreneur? And, and is this a person that you, you can work with together? Um, besides ABEN, I work with VC for Africa, which is a large online community of uh, entrepreneurs and investors. And I work with a Dutch uh, NGO where we uh, finance uh, entrepreneurs in fragile states, in the post-conflict states. And that's much more uh, debt, uh, uh, grants, and loans. Wonderful. Thank you all. OK. And so next, I'd like to talk about some of the differences in companies that you've seen in the US versus in Sub-Saharan Africa. So um, firstly, I want to commend and uh, all of the entrepreneurs that are here today. To start a company in, on the continent is, is, a, is a big challenge. Uh, from operating costs, from um, volatility in local currencies, to bureauc bureaucratic complications, we'll leave it at that. And um, if, if some of you can talk about uh, either some of the differences or the similarities that you've seen in, um, in, in companies launching here versus Sil Silicon Valley versus Silicon Sahara? Well, I think um, first on challenges, I mean, local companies have to deal with the re regular uh, challenges and constraints that every entrepreneur globally has to do, plus 20 others. <laughs> I mean, you don't have electricity. Um, the internet is, is not working all the time. Um, setting up a business, governance issues, not really being able to understand what regulation is and how it affects your business. I mean, these are all major constraints. Um, in terms of, of qualities of companies, I mean, we're certainly investing in companies that we're agnostic. We don't care if the founder is African or not. We're investing in good companies. So a lot of our, a couple of our businesses are actually global founders, but with African-focused businesses. Um, and likewise, African founders with global businesses. And uh, so, so look, I don't think it's a difference between um, African or not African for us, um, but, but certainly base, basing their companies local, you have to deal with a lot more challenges on the ground. Yeah, I, can, I think that um, um, so sometimes when we speak about investing in Africa, it sounds like we're, we're moving to another planet where you know, everything is different. And I think that um, 
in my experience, there's many more similarities than there are differences. So um, if you look at the basic needs of people, uh, everyone wants to take care of their, you know, give the best to their kids and, and you know, provide for a livelihood, et cetera. So somebody, um, the things that, the, the companies that work here, if you will, also work there. Um, and then there are some specifics to, to operating in, in, in Africa. Just like, like Lexi said, there's some practical issues, electricity, et cetera. Uh, corruption is also a, a factor that you, you know, that you need to be realistic about. And uh, I also had to learn sort of the hard way how that works. And I thought that corruption was, you know, a, a guy in a, in a raincoat in a dark alley. <laughs> but in this case, it was, it was government people and tax authorities. And, you know, it can be a challenge. But you've gotten, you've gotten around it, it seems. You've yeah, so I guess that, you know, being an entrepreneur successful. requires ingenuity. Mm -hmm. And maybe being an entrepreneur in Africa, you know, some, some extra. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that uh, sort of at the macro level, there are similarities. Uh, generally, you start a company, create a product, you have an idea, create a product, and you build a team, and then you roll out and you raise money along. And this. But, so I think the difference really is context. Uh, right. So context in the sense is, for example, um, in Africa, if you give an entrepreneur $50,000, that's, that's, that's huge. In Silicon Valley, that's pocket change. That's one night at the uh, Rose, Rosewood on Sun Hill Road. Right? So, uh, so, so that's sort of, those, that's kind of context very important. So, so for example, I mean, you know, when we're speaking to LPs, we say, look, you know, we're raising a small capital, but it goes a long way to build companies. So that's one of very important context. Yeah. Um, the, the and other, that also differs by market as well. It, I mean, sure. Fifty thousand dollars in Nigeria is going to go a lot. Oh, oh yeah, into the far. into the diesel, right? Yeah. <laughs> the generator diesel. <laughs> yes. So in Nigeria, yes, it's, that's the first uh, in certain countries as well. And I think the other um, difference really is, and I think the biggest difference is really the ecosystem. Um, so if you take Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley has got an ecosystem that is incredible, um, and pretty much I think that Africa is developed in its own ecosystem. And ecosystem is going to be different. I mean, how things evolve in that sense uh, will be different. Um, and so to the very largest thing, I sit at, an, at, just, at the edge of this. Um, so I say I'm living on the edge because it's kind of like an experiment. And, and you're experimenting by doing. So you're, you're learning by doing. And so uh, you're kind of self-evaluating and making mistakes and reiterating. And to quote uh, um, um, Esther Dice, you've got to make a lot of mistakes. And then you've got to make them very fast. And I think that um, if you talk about how Africa can live frog, and I think um, it speaks to the fact that we can actually um, sort of avoid certain mistakes that have been made, right, and, and actually make new mistakes, and we can make them very fast. So to that extent, I think that we can, we can catch up with the rest of the world and actually live frog again. Okay, thank you. Uh, David, this is a specific question for you and BC sure. for Africa. Um, so it seems that we have a mixed crowd of people who are probably gener generally familiar. How many people have done business on the continent or lived there or in some capacity? Okay, and how many people are, are new to Africa, excited about the space, but not really familiar with the way business works there? Okay, okay. So uh, you run BC. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, maybe it's not, maybe it's not <laughs> okay. Africa, but middle. Oh, okay, the Middle East specifically, uh, North Africa and the Middle East versus Sub-Saharan Africa. So North Africa and the Middle East. Uh, hmm? North Africa and the Middle East. North Africa is the North Africa is in Africa. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're absolutely okay, right. Okay, I mean, okay, 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 okay. okay. Tunisia, and, and Tunisia, <laughs> the first name of Tunisia was Africa. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. No, look, the reality is that yeah, North Africa is part of Africa. So, uh -huh. for example, in my case concept, we, we have Egypt as sort of for North Africa. But we have to understand the reality is under this, this description called Sub Saharan Africa, which I think we have to change as Africa. So, I think those are problems that are internal That's that we have to. Yeah, but, but we have to yeah, do yeah, it at yeah. home. So let's let's have a. Let's I, th I think today is the Brexit. <laughs> and then <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> okay. On that note, um, quickly. So for for those from North um, <laughs> and Sub-Saharan, etc. Et um, do you have any interesting facts that maybe even those who are from the continent wouldn't be familiar with that you've found from tracking growth in the tech space in Africa through VC for Africa, your platform? 
Yeah, so um, VC Fabric is a large community of uh, online community of entrepreneurs and investors. Um, what becomes interesting is that we've been we've been around for a couple of years now, uh, which means that we can sort of you know we can we can track what's going on. We can follow entrepreneurs and you know do they do they find investors or if not why not etc. So um, like Eric said, the ecosystem is very new. There's very little reliable data, uh, especially at an early stage level. Um, so there's some some research being done. Uh, part of it's by by VC for Africa. Um, so then, for example, some of the trends that we see is that the amounts of uh, the number of ventures that are raising funds is going up. Um, the amounts are going up. So the average amount that was raised in 2015 was 320k. Uh, 240, sorry, 200,000 uh, the year before, 130 the year before. So you definitely see the trend of uh, the investments going up. Um, if you see what countries where most of the investments are made, um, you see that sort of a, a battle between Nigeria, South Africa, and Kenya, um, where the um, so the, the total capital uh, uh, spend in, uh, is the highest in South Africa. Uh, most of the deals are, uh, are uh, in, uh, I think it was uh, Nigeria last year. Um, and uh, so we also try to check you know, what, what are the, the sectors that attract uh, most, uh, uh, the most funding. Um, this is also being checked by some other organizations. And then, for example, solar, fintech, and e-commerce came out sort of as the main categories. And then when we talk about solar, it's almost always with a pay-as-you-go or a smart solution with it. It's not just a, just a hardware. Um, and uh, if it looks sort of on the angel side, then uh, there is a lot of sort of appetite, a lot of interest in you know, people that would like to get involved. Uh, so that's one of the things that I spend a lot of time on. How can you educate people and train people? And how can you bring people together? And how can you people connect with each other uh, via, via ABEN? Um, but also, like Eric said, it's also very, very, very early stage. Um, and it means that the ecosystem is, is sort of coming together with, uh, with leaps and bounds. Um, and uh, it's, it's great to have these, uh, you know, these entrepreneurs here because we need a lot of you know, success stories uh, that, uh, that can be showcased. Um, so I'm looking forward to hear your, uh, your pitches. I know this was David's question, but I have one interesting <laughs> stat. <laughs> so um, for high net worth, sub-Saharan Africans, only 14% of their wealth is actually held on the continent. So they're moving all of their money offshore and not reinvesting that in local businesses. So, so for me, if I can jump chip in. So, I mean, there's a corruption um, question, but sort of the way I look at it is that really the, if the, the impact of corruption is, is in capital flight. So just imagine that if all the money that was stolen was still on the continent, imagine what the velocity of capital would mean. Right. So, so in my view, the real challenge that Africa has is the fact that cap capital leaves the continent more than it is on the continent. I, I, I'm not applying corruption by any chance, but I'm just saying that if the money was still on the banking system on the continent, yeah. I mean, Kakinde would have raised all his money and sort of built multiple companies. I'm sure uh, Michael Mankwa would have built many companies uh, by now. Right. So, so there's a real need that um, African capital needs to sit on the continent, needs to sit in the banking system need to sort of rotate in the continent. We speak to the narrative of inter-African trade. And that's beginning to change. Actually, when you look at the recent data, I have a small research company that will be tracking this data. We begin to see that FDI inflows are not growing that fast, but inter-African trade is beginning to grow, which means that more and more companies are moving from country A to country B. And you see that with some of the entrepreneurs that we're going to hear from that are building companies. And this is how Africa is really going to change. Totally, man. And with the uh, one uh, question from the audience. Yes, it's all, it's all corruption. You look at the mic, right? Yeah. 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 Or if you could just repeat it. Sorry. So uh, I'm from Tunisia, and we have 50% of our uh, economy is a parallel economy. So uh, we have many corruption. But what I think the the problem is uh, is the ecosystem. The ecosystem of startup is still not. Uh, yeah. is still, it, it's not only in Tunisia. It's all in all Africa. So yeah. maybe, uh, maybe maybe that's the problem. The no, you're absolutely problem. right. Yeah. You're absolutely right that we didn't develop the ecosystem. But you know, um, uh, in, well, the way the world works is that capital is like the lubricant that makes this stuff work, right? So my mm. view is that if you let if, if capital is on the continent, so um, if the capital is not living in Tunisia and there's a lot of money in the banking system, then the banks can lend to you more. Right, then it's easy for you know your dad or your uncle who has more money to help you out. But the real challenge is that there's scarcity. So I'm, I'm speaking from an abundance and scarcity perspective. That's how I look at it. 
So on that note, so there was an, actually an MIT study conducted of um, tech ecosystems around the world and the key factors that uh, contributed to technology growth. So, so what, what happens in Silicon Valley? What are the factors that, that, that lead to so many exits, that lead to so many fast growing tech, tech companies? And it wasn't exclusively access to liquid capital. It wasn't just a flow of money in the market. It was also um, uh, in Silicon Valley, unlike anywhere, any other ecosystem in the world, um, has executives with averages of six to seven board membership position, positions, which means that um, people here are, are actively advising, Help. mentoring, and supporting portfolio companies. Correct. So, Absolutely. so, so, how do you how do you promote one that idea that that transition to abundance thinking that it, that idea of I have information and I will share it as opposed to the competitive where we where we what we can sometimes face in when in, in working with companies on on the continent. So, how do you one promote that idea of sharing of of um, of um, advising and then also the innovation mentality. When you come from, from economies that, um, in, uh, what I found is in, in emerging markets um, where you have uh, a history of uh, dysfunctional government systems where the people have had little to no say in the policies that are actually um, enforced or the way that the government act actually functions, it's hard to think that uh, there's a local problem here and I have the ability to incorporate or implement a solution. So how do you transition? Really quickly, last question um, before we move to the panelists. How do you, uh, how do you promote, one, innovation thinking in, in places that, that haven't before had a lot of agency for the individual? And then two, um, how, do you, how do you shift from an investor level or an individual level from the idea of scarcity to abundance, to I want to share. So, so one way that I, I think, you know, if you take Silicon Valley, it's 50 years of building this, right? It didn't happen overnight. So the first thing that this needs, you just, it's just time. So, so you have to give it time, right? which is why I said we just started. So time has a role to play. But the question is that how do you fast track your process, which is that you have to iterate quickly. So I'm excited that companies like um, Cornet, Rankard, uh, and um, some of the companies in Nigeria, Spark, Iroko TV, are beginning to invest and mentor the next generation of startups though some of them are actually startups too, right? So, so that's a way where you fast track. So you have to eat straight very quickly. Um, and that's the, the only way you can sort of advance because it's just, you know, experience you don't learn in school, you learn expertise. Experience you learn, but you get it by doing. So you have to do it and do it quickly and do a lot of it. And you're gonna fail a lot of it and then someone's gonna work and anyway. Yeah. I, I, th I think it's uh, engaging the angel network more. Um, so I, especially in Nigeria, I can't speak to other, other markets in Africa, but you know the angel network they've they've tried but not a lot of people are interested in getting involved they they feel like investing in tech is high risk but when they put their their money down and you actually do get them involved in the companies and then those people have a lot that they can do to mentor and build the companies and and lend relationships so the question is how do you get the angel network involved and i think a lot of it is just that these investors um they they don't there needs to be some sort of system, and this is where Silicon Valley can maybe help bridge this gap um, of, of learning, learning by doing the investment process. So if, if Silicon Valley can come in and partner with these local investors and become more active, I think that that um, starts a change for the better, in my opinion. And maybe a few sort of quick comments. So, um, so one is that, so angel investors tend to invest in, in what they know, what, what you're good at. So if you have experience in you know, breaking you know, baking bread, you're probably going to invest in that, that world. So on, on a tech, in the tech world, you know, obviously in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of successful tech entrepreneurs who have an exit, et cetera, who turn around and help the next generation. In Africa, there's not that many successful tech entrepreneurs who are in a position to turn around and help the next generation. We see the first examples now, but it will take more time to, you know, to help that move forward. I do think that a big plus about angel investing is, is that it's, it's smart capital. It's people that bring network, bring experience, open a lot of doors. Um, and especially for you know, entrepreneurs in a, in a very early stage, that is, they need probably much more than just the capital. Uh, the capital is one element. But the, uh, the you know, other things that an angel investor can bring is, is, is key. Maybe just a quick comment to what, what, what Lexi said. So the Lagos Angels in this, in this case are, have started something this year. Uh, they do uh, uh, quarterly deal days. It's once a quarter they uh, have a pitch session. Um, and this year they started, or we started with syndicated investments. So you can follow a lead investor and it's opened up also to non-members. So effectively, you know, we're trying to engage with the diaspora. You can follow a lead investor, someone you, 
you trust, someone who's on the ground, someone who can do the diligence, and hopefully, you know, we can, you know, release much more capital in that way. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 you know, the, we're, we're just starting, we're just trying, but we hope that's a model that works and we can replicate in many other countries. Thank you. And lastly, um, so for anyone who has experience in investing in the venture capital or tech space, uh, investor trainings, boot camps, anything that coming to the continent and leading some sort of weekend workshop, there really is nothing that exists there now. Um, we lead the tour of tech. We have another trip coming up in November. Where we'll take a series of investors from the U.S. to Lagos and Nairobi, showcasing deals, meeting with investors on ground. So if you individually or want to come with one of our organizations, this is what we do, and, and, and this is how you facilitate that bridge. So with that, um, we will move on to the rest of the pitches. Also, Speed Up Africa is a good one that's coming up in Ghana. Yes. So Speed Up Africa. Speed Up Africa, Tour of Tech. Legos Angel Network, Angel Fair Africa, <laughs> talk to us after. Uh, so, <laughs> Behram, Amor, if you'd like to come up. Well, thanks. Thanks to the panelists, thanks to Adwa, Suradeep, everybody. Can you hear? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I'm Behram, I'm from Tunisia. Uh, well, uh, I think uh, the King's idea is very good, but you have to add the T for Tunisia. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <Kings>. Update it. <laughs> T. Great. So, I'm the co founder of Simple Expert. Uh, let's start by quick show of hands, how many people here have tried to find the contractor to build the website or mobile app? Good. So a lot of you will relate with the problem we are solving in Simple Expert. Uh, building a website uh, is complicated. Why? A lot of reasons, but mainly because it's complicated to define the right budget and it's complicated to find the right contractors. What you need is Simple Expert. Simple expert is simply automated budget estimates and automated contractors recommendations. Um, so basically the way it works, you go on our website, you have a box, we ask you questions, it's a sort of dialogue, uh, you, you explain what you need and you get your estimates and recommendations in real time. Uh, we have our proprietary uh, technology. But, well, all of this is only part of the story actually because what you need is also to get the best prices and also the best quality. Uh, so how do we ensure that we get the best prices uh, building uh, these websites? Uh, we work only with companies. Uh, we do uh, due diligence. Uh, we are sure that they are able to do a great job. Uh, today we have com uh, contractors uh, uh, in Tunisia, in Senegal and elsewhere. And uh, how do we ensure that we have the best prices? Actually, this is something, uh, a very important feature in uh, Simple Expert. Um, uh, what we do is we create a continuous stream of similar projects to our contractors. And uh, the idea is to increase the capacity of, uh, of our contractors, not horizontally, by having more contractors working on the projects, but vertically. We want our contractors to be able to work on more projects, and uh, they are able to capitalize on their experience doing a great job, uh, offering great prices while having good margins. Um, so we are addressing the French market, at least uh, for now, and uh, a lot of uh, segments, entrepreneurs, uh, but also especially SMBs. Um, and um, yeah, I will finish because the, you asked me to like ask one question. Well, uh, I, I want to pick your brain about one, one important thing for, for us entrepreneurs uh, from Africa. Uh, I'm here basically to connect with a lot of people and try to find mentors. Uh, uh, do, do you... Uh, uh, do you think that there are ways to solve this uh, problem of finding mentors from developed ecosystem, exo ecosystems in a scalable and systematic way for us, uh, in, uh, in order for us in our ecosystems to accelerate the uh, learning, uh, learning cycle? That's it. Thank you very much. Um, should, we, should we answer his question now? Yes. 
Um, so, so on the, the mentorship, so we, we certainly try to bridge our portfolio companies very closely with um, talented people globally, including Silicon Valley or across the world. Um, that's our investee companies, of course. I mentioned Speed Up Africa earlier. Um, so this is an event that's being hosted by uh, Tim Draper's firm actually in Ghana. And he's bringing a bunch of people from Silicon Valley out and it's a um, very small group. They're going to sit with entrepreneurs and get things done right there at the table. So there's no pitches, there's no panels. It's really a, a get shit done sort of event. Um, so that's a good one. Um, that's my two cents. I'm sure these guys have more. Oh, well, um, so uh, I think that the, the best uh, mentors you can have um, is people who are in country that have context. Right? So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, and there's nothing wrong with having mentors from here, but the challenge that you find as an entrepreneur in Africa is a day-to-day -day basic things of running a company. Right? So, for example, one of the things I do for my company is sometimes I go on sales meetings because the fact that I just accompany them to a sales meeting makes a difference. Right. Um, Sometimes I'll just pick up the phone because they're having a challenge. Recently, one of my company was trying to get. And wait, can you explain why it makes a difference for those who are not familiar with doing business on the continent? Well, it's just a sort of it's kind of challenging, right? Uh, and I was going to give you a practical example. One of my companies needed to get a license from the regulator, and we're bidding for uh, something that without the license we cannot do it. And they've been going through this process with the regulator for a long time. And I happen to know the big guy at the regulator, so I pick up the phone and say, "Look, you know, can we fast track this because it's really now becoming a bit difficult." And then the following day, they got alliances. I mean, ideally, I want them to go through the process, but, but we didn't circumvent the process. It's just that somebody sits there and he gets paid uh, every month and also incentivized to do the thing faster. You were just so, creative with the process. <laughs> right. So, so that person, whether he does it today or does three months from now, is not relevant. And so, so, so that context is not there. But for the startup, that is a very important context between getting the next contract and dying. So then I had a conversation and I sort of explained that it's urgent, so um, since you have a pretty, can you process it? All right, so, so there are those important, simple things that a mentor or being involved in a company can help make or make companies that sometimes you don't see in the worst because you have processes and systems that work that incentivize to move faster or to work at a certain pace, so you have predictability, you have certainty. You don't have certainty or you don't have predictability. For example, I mean, the other challenge is for most investors is just the idea of the rule of law. So you take a case to court, right? The court process is running so slow. You a startup, you die before the case. Actually, it's a startup that unfortunately has gone into court with, um, with a big multi, uh, multinational, uh, well, not multinational, big uh, company in Africa. And I say you shouldn't do that because by the time the case finishes, you're out. Right? So that's something that if I was running a company, I would like to negotiate and go see if the company actually resolve it as opposed to going to court, right? But here you go to court because the court system will work and probably it'll finish faster, right? So those yes. things uh, uh, just makes a huge difference. Okay. And maybe I'll pass looking at the time. Yeah. The... Mm -hmm. cool. Oh, moving on to the next uh, presenter, Melissa McCoy. Yeah, recording. Okay. Cool. Okay. I just have these cards here to help me. So somebody could hold the mic for you. Yeah. <laughs> I think I can probably manage. Sure? Yeah. Don't worry. Don't worry. Um, hi everyone. I'm Melissa McCoy. I um, started ConnectMed last year as part of my master's in computer science thesis project at Oxford on a Rhodes Scholarship. I'm excited to tell you today how we're taking the venture forward this year to improve healthcare access in South Africa and beyond. Um, after interviewing over 100 South African patients and doctors last year, it became clear that healthcare is inaccessible with long wait times and limited office hours, scarce with only eight doctors per 10,000 people, expensive with per capita health expenditures doubling over the past decade, and culturally sensitive with patients suffering from mental health and other stigmatized issues not knowing who to turn to. We started to think through a virtual solution that eliminates geographic and time accessibility, captures lost doctor time, thus reducing scarcity, lowers costs for both the patient and the system at large, and provides patient privacy. We decided to create this solution and call it ConnectMed, Africa's online medical practice. We have two service offerings, ConnectMed Prime, which allows upper and middle income patients to directly video consult a doctor over our web platform, and ConnectMed Care, which allows clinic workers to video consult a doctor when they're treating lower income patients. As a patient using ConnectMed Prime, 
uh, you essentially come to the site, enter your symptoms, and with minimal wait time, you'll be talking with a doctor who will diagnose you, provide you with a prescription, and have you on your way within 20 minutes flat. Our doctors can treat over 30 common ailments, ranging from cold and flus to urinary tract infections, and the list of treatable ailments is endless if a healthcare worker is with the patient to facilitate the process. To this last point, our Connect Med Care service allows such healthcare workers to consult a doctor while they're treating a patient. In South Africa, as well as across the continent, most primary healthcare clinics are only staffed with nurses or physician's assistants to keep costs low. If doctor input is needed, they either refer the patient on to a district hospital or ask them to return when a doctor comes every few weeks. Our Connect Med Care service basically lets, makes doctors immediately available for clinic workers while they're seeing the patient so that 80% of primary health care cases and patient cases can be handled at the clinic level. We charge patients, uh, we charge clinics a monthly fee um, and we're able to keep costs low by sharing our doctor network over across multiple uh, clinic networks. Another and final great thing about our platform is that we, the platform collects digitized African patient data, which is extremely hard to come by. We can combine that data with machine learning techniques to create highly accurate medical tools not possible before. For example, currently we're developing a right care triage algorithm that predicts a patient's point of care based on their symptoms, and I'll be publishing a paper on this work this year. So where are we now? We've built a technology platform, piloted the ConnectMed Prime service for over two months, planned an August pilot for our ConnectMed Care service with two clinic networks in Johannesburg, um, and raised $20,000 through competitions and grants. We also have gone through a four-month review process with the South African regulatory body, the HPCSA, to get approval to launch our ConnectMed Prime service commercially. And we expect a positive result or opinion from them in July, which will give us the sole right to operate in South Africa. With a team comprised of an ex-McKinsey consultant, an orthopedic surgeon, an experienced software engineer, we are confident we'll make ConnectMed a reality across Africa. Um, so that is it. <laughs> Thanks. Wow. Cool. Thank you. And can I can I say something? Yeah. Uh, it's okay. I'm, I'm live. Uh, so so an interesting stat uh, related to your business. Um, Ninety-five percent of healthcare data comes from one percent of healthcare institutions globally. So the data part is super interesting, and, and that's something we've seen really attractive in, in telemedicine sort of platforms. Great. So on my side, I just uh, I bought I just bought a company similar to what you're doing called Bisa App in Ghana. Okay. Um, so. Uh, connect you with the guys, probably yeah. you guys can collaborate in some form, but sort of along those lines. And I think that um, the, um, the most important thing you're doing is sort of collecting data bottom up, uh, which is kind of different from data top down. And, and, and you're right, and sort of the analytics that you're building is going to have a real impact on how a healthcare delivery is done. And I think these innovations are really going to change the world because now you're seeing the data bottom up and you're applying tools that allows you to just do things very differently. That's pretty powerful. Yeah, just as a, as a quick question maybe, how do you go about the more like regulatory issues? That's a great question. That was almost my question to y'all. Um, <laughs> so we've been going through, I said, four month review process with the HPCSA. South Africa in particular is very conservative around telemedicine. Several startups have gotten shut down in the space. Um, but we've done a lot in four months. It's been almost a year now of one, building an advisory board that is um, really well respected and also has a lot of links within the HPCSA. Um, and also we approached them proactively, which many startups didn't do, and gave them a proposal for us to have a probationary period while they could oversee us. And they seem to be um, happier about that because it's somewhat of a power play. They just want to feel like they're in control. Uh, and also there's the issue with sort of the medical practice itself where, um, you know, online electronic stuff, you know, so, so, so there's sort of that part as well that um, you have to deal with the actors of the practice itself and the implications of giving diagnosis online and not seeing patients, etc. And we're also working with those challenges, so probably the two so you can trade with the visa. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let us go, Patricia. I'm so sorry. I'm not a good English speaker, yeah, but I will French. try. Yes. Yes. Come on. <laughs> I can't understand. My name is Patricia. I come from Côte d'Ivoire, a nice country in West Africa. I founded QuickCash in 2010 with $200, and we provided a money, service, money transfer service to rural population. Our vision is to create a proprietary, connected, and active rural community throughout Africa. In the past five years, 
Precash has provided money transfer service to 500,000 persons in rural area. The big wow. bank wow. cannot be able to provide financial service to this segment of population. We have, they are focused on government and uh, big company. Let's make a, a small uh, test. Is every, every, everyone in this room has already drink a cup of coffee? Yes. 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 Raise your hand, please. <laughs> is uh, everyone in this room has already uh, eat a piece of chocolate? Yes. Raise your hand. <laughs> Do you know that the person who are working in this farm or plantation cocoa has very poor? Very poor. But I have a good news. We can change it. How? You have to give me one million of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> For this money, how we acquire a new technology, how we develop human capital, and how we establish a point of presence in this rural area. My company and I are engaged in a social mission, being a transformer for rural area. You can do the same. Come, join us, work together, and make the world better. Thank you. Can, okay. I, can I help a little bit? Uh, hmm? so, so the most important thing about what she said is that the idea that she can work with farmers who are smallholder farmers and buying from them these produce, etc., will empower them. Right. So they get markets because they get a supplier who then buys of them, and so they can produce more and they can support their family, etc. So, so it's a sort of a social enterprise that has an inbuilt mission to support these communities and make them empower them, etc. So that's really, really great. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have one question. Can you give me the money? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's pass the money box around. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Patricia. Uh, next, we have Femi. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Femi. I am from Lagos, Nigeria. Um, I run organization SME Fund. SME Fund is a different kind of seed company uh, that provide access to energy for low-income um, communities and individuals. We call them based of the pyramid market. So where it was intentional in Nigeria, where I run my business, more than 80% of the population have no access to electricity. So if you discount this, about another 30%. You only see the electricity cable passing through those communities and households without life running through them. And this gave me an early concern. What can I do about it? And our other company is Green Energy and Biofuse that provide clean, safe, affordable cooking fuel and cook stoves to this same market that we're targeting more than 90,000 women die every year in Nigeria as a result of the impact of black carbon, respiratory problem, high blood pressure, and of course, they have bad eyesight. Some of them have to back their kids even while they are working late at night trying to figure out how to put meal on the table using firewood. The smoke there is dangerous. And that's what I thought that I could do something about. I grew up with my grandmother in the village like some of us that were from Africa. So we have to travel miles in fetch of firewood. Of course, we also need to look for water from streams. So coming back, before we start another walk, trying to cook with wet firewood that will not light easily. I have to skip school most of the time. At age nine, I think I lost mama that I love so much due to what? Indoor air pollution. So she has been infected Lung cancer was diagnosed, and we lost her to that. That was what brought me back to the village to continue my education. And uh, fast forward, growing up, and then uh, working with my, on my first job, when I left that job, I wanted to make money. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So I started several failed businesses, about five of them, that I can't mention now. And five years after, I, involved, I was involved in a business that I lost all the fortune, including investors' money. Don't get scared now. 
And this actually was not as a result of the mistake that I made, but because you're working in a system whereby some other people are controlling and they are rearranging the parameters that will actually determine the success or the outcome of the business that you want to do. And we have this a lot in developing economies. So I got so bitter and I couldn't forgive my partners. I have to leave that business. And I said I wasn't going to do business again. I went into running my NGO. So it's the NGO SME fund that actually gave back to the social enterprise. So we have moved from an NGO into a social enterprise that have created these two solutions that is providing energy access to disadvantaged communities. So we're operating today in about six countries in Africa, and uh, we have positive cash flow in our revenue, and uh, we're working with great, amazing number of people. And of course, we are making impact because it's an organization that has been built on the principle of planet, profit, and of course, we are impacting people's lives. So we welcome you to check our books and see how you can engage us as we move in in the next 18 months into more additional five African countries. Thank you. Does anyone have a note? Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I would just, I don't know, we don't have a lot of time to go into this, but I think generally in your pitch, it would be great if you could have originally um, addressed, I mean, like your business model, there's many people trying to do this. So what's important is certainly your, your traction, how many customers you have, your revenue that you've realized, um, that sort of thing. So that would have been really great to understand, but we can discuss that later as well. We can discuss that after. Okay. 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 I just wanted to make that point. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Elsie from Elsie Case Company Limited. Elsie Case is a company that exports African ethnic foods. We produce these are the product lines we produce. Ausa um, coco flour, or we call it millet cereal for kids. This is an organic coconut oil. Wow. Our case started with three women with five product lines in Ghana. Currently, we have 35 product lines to our wow. advantage. Holy smoke. We export 80% of our products to Europe and North America. Wow. Currently, we are employing 80% women wow. from 3 to 80%, which is 30, 35 women. And these are women that are coming from deprived home, drop out of school. Yeah. Women who are underprivileged, I, I come across them. At times I'm in a car, I, met, I meet them, selling with their, their kids behind them. I reach out to them and tell them why this is not, I mean, what you are supposed to be going through with the kids. I give them job opportunity. I train them, empower them. This is uh, the level we are now. We have these product lines to our advantage and LCKS is trying to um, move from the ethnic foods to reach out to the Product, new product lines to product lines to uh, cater for North American consumption and European consumption, and we are under, currently undertaking our expansion projects, which uh, uh, we need financial assistance from investors to support us. That is why we are here. Great. Thank you. Wow. Incredible.
80 percent of women is incredible. That's that, I will clap for that again. That's incredible. Wow. And 35 for that line. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, and thank you to the other startups who presented today. For everyone still in the room, if you have any questions, any comments, any financial support looking for a startup in the audience, <laughs> they'll be here. Thank you all so much for coming. Have a great night. Thank you.